Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful people, and welcome to another episode of Art of the Beholder, a show dedicated to all things eclectic in the world of art, where we do deep dives into deep cuts and help you understand why damn things matter. I'm your host, Novo Day, and today we're going to be talking about art in history again. A singular artist is the topic today, and that artist is a very famous Hieronymus Bosch. To hash it out, I am, of course, joined by one of our top contributors. That's right, the single panel painting that is Mr. Philip Church. Welcome, Philip. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me, Nova. Hey, man. We love you on the team. Um, to all the good people out there, this was actually a topic by Mr. Church. So I got to ask before we dive into the thesis, the discussion, the background, why was this on your radar, my man? I've always, I, I do love art. I took art history classes uh, like of my own accord back in school and stuff. Good. And I think, <laughs> I, I think because of my love for this guy's name, that something about it pops up. And so every so often I have to scratch that itch and Google his name again. And then every time I look back into this guy, I'm a bit floored. I'm just like. Fascinating to do my own research for this episode. It It is, it's a pseudonym. It's a pen name. It's not his real name. True. Yeah, yeah. it's it's a bit of an adaptation because uh, and we'll get there. Well, because of all kinds of reasons. Yeah, exactly. It's like well, m many many reasons yeah. that we will get to. But yeah, he's just he's got one of those like weird names. It's an earworm, and so be, I think that maybe both his name and his art stuck out to me in my youth, and so just it just it gets in the back of my head now and again, and I just have to go scratch the itch. I'm glad you put it that way because when I was doing my research, doing my homework, the first thing that popped in my head about this particular painter was he was so ahead of his time. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was painting fantastical works well before there was even a genre known as fantasy. You would think this guy's friends with Dali. Exactly. I, I feel like this had to have been, I don't know the history there. Salvador Dali is one of my favorite artists and surrealism is one of my favorite periods of all time in art history. And I find it fascinating that this could have been maybe Salvador Dali's inspiration. Reincarnation, perhaps? Who knows? You know, all things are possible. I mean, he was um, he was clearly exploring concepts of the surreal before there was even a genre of surrealism. I, w I will also go almost say this. Everybody, pause this real quick. Go look at yeah. this guy's art. Try to avoid the date. And then tell me when you think exactly. it was painted. Well, then look it up. The, the Hieronymus Challenge. So it'll be on TikTok before yeah. you know it, right? <laughs> Hashtag Hieronymus Challenge. <laughs> Our friend Toon Day is going to set us up for that one, too. He promised a big follow on that one. We're we know. We, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We know, we're no, we yeah, know the family, the Bosch family is huge fans of the show, just yeah. like Toon Day. But ahead of his time, yeah, like you said, it, it's, it's, it's an understatement. When I was learning the history of it, I mean, his... His style, his approach really changed the game for centuries to come. And um, God, I can't wait to talk about it. But before we get there, of course, we need a little background. He was born Jeronimus, that's Latin for Jerome, if you're wondering, Van Aken. And he is a Dutch Netherlandish painter from Brabant. Born, <laughs> the historians don't know exactly when it was, but it was circa 1450 that is 1450 part of the fun is knowing that leave literally it's like when did he live yeah could he still be alive like who was Hieronymus Bosch and of course he was one of the most notable painters of the early Netherlandish painting school now his pseudonym Bosch if you're wondering I know you guys are dying to know it derives from his, his birthplace actually because Den Bosch means the forest so it's like Hieronymus or Geronimus of the forest. His paintings were generally oil on oak wood, and his focus was usually on the fantastic, as already stated, and the surreal, usually within the realms of the religious, specifically that of Judeo-Christian faiths, most notably, and this is what, oh man, I love this stuff, is uh, the darker side of the religious tales, and that is in his very famous hellscape depictions. I, I don't know what it is, Philip, um, I've always been drawn to dark imagery, dark art. There's, there's something, I think there's something, you know, art always mirrors humanity, the human condition. And there's something about dark art, dark imagery that I think it speaks to me the most because 
um, the human condition is often a difficult one. And when a painter really, uh, <laughs> it's a little bit of an understatement in the last couple of years, but, uh, the, when an artist really captures that in his pieces, it, it speaks to me. It always speaks to me. And there's something about, especially when it touches on surrealism, fantastical pieces, and something that obviously that we cannot conjure in the real world. So it's never just a bowl of fruit on a fucking table or a landscape. It is the dark, corners of the human mind yeah the shit that you that you hadn't admitted was there yet but when you look at it it's familiar right you're like yeah i i wouldn't have known how to paint it myself but looking at this i get yeah. it. yeah <laughs> and his bio really mirrors that i mean little very very little is known about this guy his life his history even his personality it's like a portrait of him too that everybody's again like it could kind of look like him but it was drawn after he was dead and this is very fitting for our show because it obviously the, the focus is on the art and that helps to create this kind of mysticism to not only him as a painter, but the paintings themselves. Yeah, there's nothing to color. You know, it's literally pure speculation, which is almost more fun as opposed to other times when you're like, well, you know, because at the time this man was a Bolshevik. So when he painted <laughs> this elephant, you know, he it's like, no, there's there's none of there's literally nothing to be read into. <laughs> there's like one posthumous uh, sketch of him done right and practically nothing else not to mention i mean again the guy worked under a pseudonym like who did that in in the 15th century <laughs> that alone actually is something big that i'm hoping you also were going to touch on later but that is definitely something like worth discussing in my opinion actually he was uh he was before his time in a lot of ways i'm not sure if you read this when you were doing your homework he would sign his name on his pieces and back then th that was unheard of you know now it's very commonplace common practice right but to have a signature, you know, a Hirona Bosch at the bottom right hand or left hand corner of the piece was unheard of. And he did this countless times with with a lot of his most notable pieces. And we, we should we should touch on this. We are going to obviously when we get in the discussion section, we are going to um, focus on the art, focus on his paintings. The, the thing is, is not a lot of them survived those centuries. Um, and so we're going to probably stay to a more of a more famous, well known list of his work Play, we're playing the hits yeah <laughs> we're playing the hits you got it best of Hieronymus Bosch coming up before we, but yeah coming up but before we hash it out of course a word from our sponsor this episode is brought to you by the novel The Entropy Sessions a tale of loss love and madness and our past present and future relationships with technology find it on Amazon and as an audiobook through Audible if you would like to hire Philip Church for any of his incredible talents narration of a book audio engineering, education, you name it, you can reach out to him at philipchurch.tech. Now back to the show. So the first thing I want to do before we actually dive into the, the pieces themselves is you guys got to know something, and that is with what is called a trip tech. Now, a trip tech, if you don't know what that is, is a work of art that is divided into three sections, also known as panel painting, or three carved panels that are hinged together. Now, think of like a book that opens as a tripod. They usually have paintings on the inside. Sometimes it's one huge piece. Often with Bosch, you would do three separate paintings. And we're going to talk about that a lot through the episode, so I, you guys have to know that before we move on. Now, uh, you can close it like a book, as already mentioned, and even the outside can be painted as well. So we're going to discuss and really dissect not only the inner workings of his art style, his approach, his legacy, but kind of touch upon these things. So you have to know that in the back of your mind, remember the trip tech. His style was often considered comparatively sketchy in manner, contrasting with the common practice technique of the time of smooth surface painting. So his surfaces were rough or what is called at the time impasto paintings. And like I already said, I, I, I see this in my, my outline notes right here, but uh, it was not common to sign paintings but he did it and again with the the bosch with the pseudonym name exactly. like, again not quite his real name <laughs> and and if we even know how he truly spelled it if it was more of geronimus von aachen compared to hieronymus bosch then then it's all the more different than his true name that it's not just something where you're like oh well that's clearly this guy it's like oh you'd have to probably put some guesswork in 
outside of knowing the style of it. Okay, well, he's from somewhere in this region. I think a lot of that goes back to the religious imagery that you mentioned and the fact that, again, this oh. is the 1500s. This is a deeply religious, religious area. religious imagery, yes. And, but you have to think about how people used to be so persecuted for things that were heretical and good God, the man's material. A lot of these things could have gotten another person killed. <laughs> and I do wonder if that's not part of why he developed and signed, um, but, you know, Ron as, as his pseudonym. Yeah. yeah. I I, I kind of I couldn't help but think of that as his own like way to cover his ass of being like, I want this work attributed to, quote unquote, me, but I also don't want to be burned at the stake. Yeah. And I think we're, you know, once we get in, dive into his most famous pieces and that's real right away. So bear with me. But the hellscapes alone, you know, you could do an entire fucking master thesis on just the right paneling any one of his works yeah <laughs> is, is is it's like usually the right side novel. you know you could put it anywhere but it's usually the right side the third act yeah. usually the best and, and that's where he depicts his hellscapes so let's dive right in so in 1491 uh, approximately to 1498 his first most famous piece is known as the Adoration of the Magi. Now, this is again a triptych, and um, the outside is depicting Saint Gregory's Mass. On the inside, if if I actually might uh, interrupt real quick, please. To my understanding, I believe it's Magi. Ma Magi. Okay, the Adoration. I of think Ma so. Uh, of the I Magi? was forced to go Magi? to religious school, so I would, I could have sworn it's pronounced Magi. I will take Magi. I will take your word for that. Now, uh, I feel like the this particular piece. Again, it's a trip tech. When you open it up, I'm looking at it right now. It's and uh, people listening, I urge you to, to uh, pause the show, pull up the Googles, ask the Googles for his pieces so you can follow along like good boys and girls. And um, this is pretty tame, this first one, right? He is um, a lot of neutrals, except for these accents of red that we see in the clothing of the people. But it's, um, there's really well, nothing. Is it that tame though? I, well, okay. I would say, relatively speaking, Philip, compared to his other stuff, especially on the very the very next one, important work is the, the Garden of Earthly Delights. Especially compared to that one. But if, if I I may on actually the Magi was also one of my kind of favorites to point out of his because relatively unique to his other works in that often it's it's clearly like whether it's uh like the physical location or some kind of implication of a passing of time yeah often his three scenes are different in that manner as well this is actually one collective contemporary if you will like it all three panels of the triptych uh, take place. It, it it is all the scene. It right? is the, the scene, foreground. Right. Yeah, this the, is the not... whole foreground is the gathering of the magi. But another uh, interesting thing is it, there still are those roots of horror in a way. Like there's that one dude creepily looking in behind Mary, and he's got like a <laughs> sallow face, and that's creepy. There's a dude over to one side, hunched over a fire, and he looks bitter. I don't know. He's like doing something creepy. I swear to God, there's a guy flashing his dick to a lady in the background on one side. There's a man on a turban being chased by a crowd. They look angry. Um, there's a wolf chasing a woman on another side. Like That's one of the things. That, it's still such a bosh when you pay attention to these weird, tiny... I swear to God, there's like somebody like naked on a, on a pole oh, uh, in the middle. I, well, we're going to get to a lot of the nakedness here soon. I mean, yeah, the ar and the architecture in the background is... is to my knowledge, fantastical. I do not believe that 15th century Flemish buildings quite maybe looked like that. And that the guy's imagination is wild. And that's where I want to touch on his use of detail. What when I really was analyzing his pieces, his use of detail is much more focused on volume than like I, I think if we were to, to zoom in more on these pieces, it's not like you can see every tiny wrinkle in their skin kind of detail, but he puts so much into his pieces, right? I mean, there's it's so dense. much. Yeah, density is a good word. There's a, so much at play. There's so much movement. There's so much, usually a lot more color. And this one is a lot more earth tones, blacks, whites, Yeah, grays, and this one is browns. very rural. It, this yeah. is, is his Flemish background. This is like the, again, like a rural pastoral background for the most part. Uh, that that was from sort of like the the pre Flemish Renaissance of the time. So this is him. Like he said he's just kind of starting out. He's picking a pretty popular scene, like again the the Magi visiting the the Madonna and Child, but still in like basically in Flemish territory. Yeah, and I think this is a good prologue. You know, this is a good appetizer for the real meal, which is the Garden of Earthly Delights. 
That's the one. If anybody has seen a Bosch, it's, probably that it's one. Probably. And, this and is honestly, the, like I, the gift shop, I would say, like, yeah. And of all, like the books I actually researched for this, it would usually be the Hellscapes right panel, and it would just be like close-ups of that for just the first, the front cover page of the book, which you could spend hours dissecting and thinking. Yeah, about. talk about density, right? So let's dive in. This is just to give you guys a little bit of context. Again, this is fourteen ninety five, circa eh, to about fifteen oh five. On the left, we're dealing with another tri uh, trip tech. On the left is we're we're getting into the deep biblical shit, guys. This is the Garden of Eden, and we're seeing, of course, Adam and Eve. Uh, diving right in, I actually so. What I did was I pulled all these pieces up, but this piece I wanted to actually save. I did a .jpg of this guy so I could really zoom in. And uh, let's start on the left. Enhance. <laughs> Enhance. Like Blade Runner, right? Enhance. <laughs> Enhance. Um, but let's, uh, Philip, let's be methodical about this guy. Let's go uh, from top to bottom, as we like to say, and left to right on this guy. Let's do the three acts, and let's start with the left. Now, uh, the first thing I, I, I think jumps out to me is the fantastical imagery. What are those uh, structures in the background right? to you? Um, what that's, are those? It, and that, that is actually a good way of phrasing it. Um, it, yeah, I mean, I don't know whether to call that a, a building is it or a living call, thing. Is it, I, I, it's, it's very hard to say because yeah, it's like, it, it almost reminds me of a fountain to an extent. One of them does. Um, it literally looks like there's at least water coming out of it, but the shapes do not make any sense it looks organic right um that's the other bizarre thing is that it's it, very it, otherworldly it, it's very surreal yeah. it's hut like in formation but what are they just like uh philip was citing that there wasn't this kind of architecture back then it, 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 there's definitely nothing in recorded history this did not, I, I, this I did will not exist so much money on this because yeah it's like okay that other one they might have had a building shape like that. It's possible because that could be built by a human. Right. This is some fifth dimension, like wear your tinfoil hat shit. Like, and <laughs> somebody saw this in a dream, clearly. And that's another fun thing that I'm, I'm assuming you also had planned to bring up is the uh, the ergotism. Woo wee, that's going to be a fun thing to get into once we get to hellscape. Yeah, I once will we get to hellscape. Elaborate. Okay. There are birds. A lot of it's like very much the Genesis y stuff. But again, if you zoom in, there's like a weird kangaroo dog. There's like a bird, right? A, a frog bird coming out of the water. Like it's not actually just a Garden of Eden, a lovely Garden of Eden. To like, me, again, if you looked at this, it'd be like heretic. I I can't help but see stories in art consistently. And when I look at this piece, I on the left I see heaven, and the middle I see um, our existentialism. Middle Earth, if you will, like our uh, conceptual conceptualization yeah. of what reality is, and then the other end, which is obviously hell, right? Oh yeah. Um, and yeah, just talking, you know, before we move on to the middle, which is <laughs> what a great, great little orgy scene we got here. This uh, is too damn much to talk about. <laughs> it's it's huge. It's uh, well, it's just so it's so loud and busy and vibrant and moving yeah, the and it, it's not just the detail of each thing it's that there's literally 500 that's things why yeah there. that's why in the last piece again that was an appetizer for the meal it's so dense again it's part of what makes it was a, vol so yeah, a volume of detail not necessarily i think if we zoomed in it wouldn't yeah we wouldn't see every wrinkle or tiny little thing on the people uh but there's just so much going on so yeah let's i i feel like the left before we move on to that the garden of Eden, adam and Adam and Eve scene is kind of tame, you know, in a way. And it's it still is very fantastical and uh, spiritual. And then we get to the, and then let's get to the middle. And the first thing that jumps out to me is it's still vibrant. A lot of great colors, a lot of movement, a lot of, um, talk about, very dynamic, <laughs> yeah, action. Uh, very dynamic. Uh, it's, it's aptly named too, the Garden of Earthly Delights, because uh, yeah. immediately you're seeing all of, the earthly delights that, you know, in life, greatest things are for free, right? And we're seeing it right here. <laughs> yeah, this is this is not just looking free. Like, there was no currency. So, obviously, touching was too because the touch, they did. Yes. Um, so, and they didn't just touch each other. They touched, they didn't give a shit what it was. And, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't, let's not beat around the bush, no pun intended, um, that this, to me, this is a, a scene of, 
of lovemaking, group love. Like, absolutely, there's a lot of love. There's a lot of har- harmony. There's a lot of there's a lot of happiness, for lack of a better word. I mean, it's literally. I mean, there's there's the people. There's feeding each other. It's literally like almost classic Roman style, like actual orgy. Like not yeah. just oh, ha ha. There's lots of penises. People are having sex. This is like a <laughs> people are in the pond. People are touching the weird scorpion monster but they're cool because they're, they're inside the Why scorpion not? monster yeah for the like you know this this like tree root is actually made of like just writhing body but we need to talk um, about this there's still the fantastical imagery especially in the background we're seeing the hut like yeah. structures actually bigger yeah this is the quote-unquote creatures too again like there's these aren't animals um and again to be inclusive i, I might have mentioned this in the magi uh one previously that there was i, I appreciate that one of the magi wasn't again looked african um, and that granted they, in this one, they are literally like black in color, but it's, it's yeah, interesting it's a hard to black, me again, right. like it's one of the weird ways that I do feel that he was progressive beyond his years oh, is yeah. that he, he knew that one, at least one of the Magi's would legitimately be African to, to show the importance of people came from all around the world. That's, that shows an intelligence and an awareness, you know, but this is also very interesting that, and the, so the fact that that one predates this one and he very intentionally said, this isn't an African. This is literally a like a black human. Right. And that's just all the more to like, OK, like and again, once again, they're just talking. Right. Everybody's touching. Everybody's talking. Are they black? Is it a bird? To go back is it a to scorpion <laughs> and the scorpion monster uh, and, and to go back to the storytelling aspect of how I am or we are to interpret this piece is. We're, did God give us everything we needed and we were so happy and so vibrant and so harmonious that what led us to was it our own humanity that led us to the third panel the the downfall of humanity if you will that we brought hell to earth like we had you know in the middle i'm like we had everything yeah there's food on the trees is it is it our sin you know was it that we brought greed and all of these horrible things and we couldn't stop and then we and that leads us to scene seen right the 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 right panel the third piece and it is where to start i think i think honestly the best place to start is just with the incredible contrast bright vibrant colors to dark harsh i mean the whole piece oh this your is i will incredible. always go this to it because it's so dark yeah I, I love the background and how he handles just the shadowy like amorphous buildings in the background and actually to to your point real quick on that last bit i think the choosing of calling it the garden of earthly delights because there is the garden of eden yeah but that's where the first sin took place right and so to your point yeah like would the garden of earthly delights not bring out all the more sin in man if they couldn't even hack it in the Garden of Eden, like we literally botched it in the first day. So then we get we go to this other place where we find even more apples and all these other things that we can fuck and we did it. And then we wind up in this awful place on the right that I mean, the next thing that I, I do also want to point out um, that you might have also known um, the weird like open assed egg creature. Well, with that's like a plate I'm, on its head. That's that's where my eye always goes first. My yeah, eye, it's the biggest creature. It's the brightest color. Uh, I think it was the, the lighter point shades. too. I feel like if we were actually to, you know, art historians and um, analytics, they'll dry, draw literal lines to see where he wanted that. Focal it's point. dead and, center. Well, it's like off center. You know, so it's true. It's a little up upwards of center, yeah. but still, it's, a it's left, quite like central. But it just hits me, and especially with the the person looking at you, that's a little. Well, and that, yeah, it's got a huge face to it, which I think also catches your eye. But that's the my one of my favorite things about this face, and I I ch- personally choose to believe that this must be true. That that is actually a self portrait. You know what? Now that you say it, and I've I've been looking at his his face all week. That does look a lot like him. Why would he put himself I, in the hellscape? I, he was a troubled individual, which again we. <sighs> Aren't, too aren't we all? Aren't all artists a little? <laughs> we we channel yeah. we channel the 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 demons right we into embrace our the art and we use it to make money. <laughs> yeah, no, I I think that's a, it, it's one of the interesting things that like a lot of artists kind of sneak themselves in here and there. Like sometimes it's like oh. Haha, there was a mirror in the room that I painted you in, so I painted myself in your mirror. It's like, again, a weird way of signing without signing, because, again, people didn't sign their names. And interestingly, um, I think that in a way, I mean, again, I think he was truly, like, tortured to an extent that this guy had had obviously an insanely active imagination. But in a time where religious persecution and fear had to be very real. I mean, again, like, if you said the wrong things, you probably could get, like, excommunicated, if not, like, killed. So it's I think in a way this is him having to deal with guilt of just 
I'm going to pop my face on this. People are going to be so busy looking at everything. They'll never really pick up on the fact that that's me because I'm just a nobody. I'm, I'm Geronimus Von Eck. And who do you talking about? This painting? <laughs> that's Geronimus Bosch right there. It Duh. is. I mean, it is a series of tortured souls. So you think him as a tortured soul is uh, apt to, uh, yeah. to be in, I would the, say so. in, in this piece specifically? Because even even in the non-healthscape, again, there's some pretty creepy stuff. The yeah. other stuff is still dark in a way, but not actual like violent, like in color tone dark, like this one truly is of like, there's no question that this is hellish, a hellscape. Yeah, it's, there's it's clearly fire. It's and torture. Demons. It's it's yeah, it's hellfire. Not it's, the fun sex. <laughs> it's the complete opposite of the first two panels, essentially. But I yeah. mean, OK, and now let's let's pull the lens back a little bit, Philip, because now when we look at all three of them together, so we talked about them separately. Now, when we talk, you know, we look at the whole thing together it helps as a, uh, you know, art needs to be unifying in a way. And the vibrant colors lead my eye to the dark, the dark hellscape that is the right panel. And that's what I think a, a, a traditional artist wants to help you do as the audience member, as the on onlooker is you want you want that eye to really scour the whole thing. And especially with the volume of detail, like we talked about, you can't help but be moved around in the piece and the piece becomes even bigger because of it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, and that was the beauty of the triptychs too, is that even, okay, this looks like a, a like a, a thin panel of wood, but then you fold out the two like slightly smaller, like front, basically like the front covers to, to reveal the main panel, which again is always bigger because panels one and two, one and three are each half the size. And like you said, the way it opens almost like a double ended book. Um, and so, yeah, it's interesting that of course, like it's always going to, have its parts like there's always important stuff kind of going on in the big that's your big canvas sure and that's where he packed the most action and yeah i mean like i mentioned earlier this is very different from the from the uh adoration of the magi in that uh that was again all one scene all one uh not to mention it was a different shape this one is is rectangular and he has not only more canvas but this is three distinctly different i mean obviously what's happening in the middle that's not in the garden of eden that never happened according to the bible right. or any other texts and obviously on the right is hell. So these are clearly not only different locations, but possibly forward in time, because of course the Garden of Eden was first. Time or dimension, right? you know? And Both. Uh, exactly. Location and time have passed, obviously, to, to the point where there's souls that deserve to be tortured. Uh, compared to when there was just two, right? There was just and and, and just so, to touch on um, that artistically, his use of scale, I think, is very ahead of its time because obviously, on the bottom, the the figures are a little bigger to give you a yeah. sense of scale, and then obviously, the depth. yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> really depth. good depth of field, uh, exactly. But the detail is barely lost. Again, that's part of the impressive bit, right? That thing in the background is clearly a horse, but it looks like it's a hundred meters away, right? And 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 you have to, I know. So when people actually look at this, they have to take that with a grain of salt because, again, this is when artists were starting to really master this and and come up with a lot of these ideas. Because obviously, we see artists now that, oh my God, the the amount of scale Peter Grick comes to mind. G R I C. Look up his stuff. That that's a pre gym a pre gym gym of the week for you guys. But um, I think uh, before we move on to his other pieces. I think this is, in my humble opinion, one of his, I would say, magnum opus. Absolutely. This this one, it, it's, again, it's just, there's just something to it. It, it. He, like, peaked early. I don't know what, what else to say other than just, it, it, is a, it is a masterwork. Again, just across the diversity, yeah, of just of how, how much this one piece of art says. Um, it, it says more than could possibly even be understood. Right. So I, I say to anybody listening, uh, if you've never heard of Mr. Bosch, at least Google this one. Google this one really dissect it or digest it uh, and yeah I think it, it will really move you the next thing on our list is the creation of the world again circa 1500 it is a little um, return to form no no pun intended again he just looking at the piece there's a sense of three dimension that I don't think a lot of artists of his time would really focus on and I was I was impressed with the work I guess again uh in, form, in terms of detail and things like that. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because I think another amazing work is two more down, The Last Judgment, but we have to get to Herman Saints, the 
Kermit Saints trip tech before then. Uh, he liked his weird saints. Yes, indubitably. Um, and uh, but, actually, real quick, too, is just as you're touching on the creation of the world. Well, it's very worth noting that, again, like the way that the trip tick, the, the outside, it's, it's literally like you're opening a book painting. The, that's the outside of the Garden of Earthly Delight. It's literally all technically one piece. It's five pieces of art in one where the inside and the outside are two separate pieces of their own self. So again, like you have five total panels. The outside is the creation of the world, which is like you said, vastly different in style. You would not expect to open up this beautiful marble of this detail, this like ethereal work to see this insanely vivid, colorful depiction of again, like life and orgies and, and other worldly delights and tortures. Um, so that's what's awesome about this. It's the same thing. It's the same piece. And these are big. Again, this thing is like six feet like tall by when you open it up, like probably nine feet wide. So let's move on to Hermit Saints Triptych. Again, 15, circa 1500. Um, this one- uh feel dirty. Like I, f it's like he did such a good job of with the dark tone because these are the Hermit Saints. I, yeah, I like feel like some of the dirt looking at this. I'm like, I, want, I, I don't feel clean anymore. And I don't mean that in like my soul. I literally just like, how vivid the last one was this is again just it's already vastly different he's just all over the map there's a little weird creature here there's what looks like a nun's head walking like somewhere in one corner in like a dark area yes. like again there is some some weird some shit but again fuel here these yeah. these yeah like these hermit uh saints part of a lot of again the the obsession you know like uh, the religious zeal is what made people saints so, and so a lot of times this in a way is his interpretation of what made these people suffering uh, deliver, deliver them to their sainthood. Yes. You know, like, exactly. again, he's telling the story, like you keep saying, like, this isn't just nothing. Yeah, it's like, yes, there's a lot of stuff going on, but it has intention. It's not just some guy going like, oh, I'm going to put this over <laughs> here. It's not like a weird evil Bob Ross. It's literally a like- I would, ooh, I would a like man to see that. I would like to see evil yeah. Bob Ross. What he's he completely, <laughs> completely bald and he's like- you Upside fucked up down trees. trees. Yeah, he would, he, would, he would just like, it would just be like heretical uh, tree art everywhere. Oh man, I'd be an accident. to see that. Okay, well, like, you know, we'll work on that. We'll workshop that outside. But <laughs> yeah. um, yeah, again, there's, it's, it's weird it back, how like, right? every, yeah, everything here is very much intentional. There are no happy accidents here. Um. But again, there's it's elements of it are are, are horrific uh, if you aren't looking for it. And yeah, I think this leads perfectly into another magnum opus. Even though I think uh, the Garden of Earthly Delights is is number one in my book, The Last Judgment is an incredible piece. You can practically smell the brimstone. I mean, the actual <laughs> fire like in the it. background, like it. it's more desolate looking. Like it's not as chaotic and busy. It, it implies to me that there's already been like a wave of like murder. Like these are the stragglers. You know, like this is the true ends of the earth here. That like is, the middle, the, last the middle is fresh. is the rapture essentially, right? Oh, uh, I thought the rapture was when like the good people get taken before this shit happens. I thought the good people are taken, but then we're seeing this in terms of the aftermath of that. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't no, know. I definitely enough. know religious historian. <laughs> uh, I don't know, so I have to I don't ask. remember off the top. I, okay. I don't remember well enough to say. But yeah, just pulling it back. Yeah, uh, that is a good way <laughs> to put it. You could you could smell the brimstone. You can feel the heat. You can feel the the earth shaking underneath your feet, right? Uh, it's um it's it's powerful. It it is a it is a strong piece. I feel like the one the thing that really hits my eye is the is the fire breathing demon to the far right, kind of in a greenish color, uh, that's looking straight up, and that's creating its own kind of movement. Yeah, actually, it's a good way, like, of putting it. The, the fact that each of these miniature scenes has its own sense of movement that it it's meant to just continuously guide your eyes around. You can't help but like see something so awful that you don't want to dwell on it. And I almost wonder if that's like intentional. But that's also part of his like other not so hellish things that that is just so busy that you can't stop looking around everywhere. So. It's hard to say how how deep you want to try to read into that or interpret or project it all of just like, I think he's making a point of this. It's like, well, I don't care. Uh, it's very active on just to put it like bluntly and awesomely is that still clearly experimenting with different styles between like, again, sometimes it's vivid and colorful. Sometimes it's a little more dusky and like blended together mm -hmm. and, re and, and grounded. And then other times it's like, 
just truly uh again like like again like you can like to feel the smog in the air like you almost know that there's soot uh just constantly like it's crazy how he continues to change and grow in his style and i think that helps us uh transition to the very next piece with the martyrdom of saint julia because i'm seeing that evolution right away in his technique technique and skill set because now even though we're closer to the story and again this is one instead of three separate pieces this is one gigantic piece over the three panels uh it we're seeing a lot more of the detail in the shadow work in the lighting yeah this is an actual folk this isn't like how many people can i cram in this one you can actually kind of get a head count and understand what's going this is a much less busy this is him reining it in and as far as just the artistic value goes and the quality and trying to analyze the technique i'm i'm seeing i you know as much as i do love the other pieces and there's a lot of detail they are still a little flat to me where this one is very is much more three-dimensional it's much more rounded it's much more alive i think I see it with the, the wrinkles of the the dress and, you know, just those clearly because, you know, he's still putting in a lot of detail in, but his detail is a little more focused. It It is in the in the way that uh, I mean, granted, Magi was more uh, there was a lot of background to it. This one is very much clearly focused on this one thing. Mm -hmm. And as a result, he yeah, he's able to make the subjects of this painting like properly large and take up a, a majority of the canvas. And as such, it's like he's maybe it's like somebody challenged him to be like, dude, you're not, you know, like you're, you're, you're not like the Flemish guys over here. Like you, but it's as if someone challenged him to be more Flemish of like, what is this? You know, like you're painting all this wild stuff with like pig demons and like, just, you know, can you give me something like a, I can really enjoy here? Um, you know, Geronimus, and he was like, okay. And, you know, he did. He he painted a much larger scene, again, Renaissance type things where, yes, there's different things happening, but it's almost more akin to your um The Last Supper, where, okay, these two people are talking, these three people are talking. There's a small action here, you know, like this guy fainted. Um, but it's all central. It's it's all still contained within the major story itself. And as he continues to evolve and uh, fine tune his artistry, we're still seeing an evolution, which brings us to the Temptation of Saint Anthony. And this one, to me, this one is a more fantastical and surreal than trying to depict a you know a traditional. Uh, story of something like Adam and Eve or the last judgment or something like that. It's still very, we got a lot of Bosch staples still a lot of movement, a lot of detail, uh, a lot of weird, great weird shit. But this one is a little more fantastical with uh, yeah, with their, with his use of creatures and, and uh, everything that I'm looking at here. So. And, and this is definitely where I want to bring back up um, something I mentioned earlier about St. Anthony's Fire, also known as Ergot. Ergot is, uh, it's basically like when a certain kind of grain like goes wrong, like when formation, fermentation or something like, but in, in a grain and it's it's gone wrong. And you can literally get something called uh, ergotism. Okay. And part of what that does is uh, it can give you mania and psychosis. So that's the interesting thing is that I almost wonder if depending on I'm not 100 percent, obviously, on the history of when it was called St. Anthony's Fire. Yeah. But Bosch had a uh, that was his. Interestingly, he was like a little more focused on St. Anthony than some of the other saints that he did uh, works on. But the fact that, um, again, like it makes all the more sense that this guy might literally just be tripping balls sometimes <laughs> and that this is what his brain takes him through of having these awful fears of hell and persecution um, and that he might literally be accidentally eating poisoned grain that is making him trip. And that is part of uh, literally like the, the actual kind of part is as far as my understanding too, is like it is related to the story of St. Anthony again, hence it, it's called St. Anthony's fire, this affliction. God, that is, if anybody knows, uh, if anybody's a Bosch, historian out there please tweet at us email uh, email us uh, i want to know more now i feel like this is we need a part two almost uh but before we get there of course we need to talk about the haywin and the passion famous passion tri uh, trip tech uh the haywin to me is um 
it's kind of, a, again, a return to form. It's a little flatter. I don't know if it's just the image I'm seeing. And maybe it's been through the sands of time. It has lost a lot of its uh, art value. Maybe that oil has kind of depreciated over time. And it's just looking flat because of that. It's also a picture of a picture. So, uh, But uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, the same. It's still incredible. It's still a lot of... To me, again, we're back to the... the to the three acts and it's a to me a grounded version of um the last judgment it's like a literally a grounded again it's like someone challenged him to be more flemish it's like well i loved this one but can you make it more grounded for me because my parents hellscapey yeah it's like my family's (laughs) very conservative and your things give us nightmares can you dumb it down so you still literally have like the being in the sky on the left with like and the being angels coming down becoming yeah yeah so you've got both you've got the insects coming down to the earth you still see what looks like Adam and Eve. Like again, it's it's interesting how similar it is and still boshy, and yet it's but like very complete, different. It's like a, a reboot. Way. Yeah, it, that's a great way to put it. Yes, it's a revisioning. It's a reboot. It's a reimagining. He knows uh, his yes. strengths, but oh, he's yeah. not done. Yeah, he stay. He he definitely has a lane that he likes to stay in, but uh, that lane is powerful. And it, like I said, going back to the thesis, it was clearly ahead of its time. Remember, people. Uh, this is the uh, 16th century, right? We just started 1500, 1505, things like yeah, that. Yeah, barely into the 15th, uh, uh, yeah, 16th century here. And um, I, I really feel like it it comes, it's rounded out with the passion trip tech. Now, find, I found a lot of different search results with this. Uh, describe the passion trip tech that is the one that you're looking at. Uh, this one, honestly... It almost strikes me as like a series of like Renaissance family portraits or something. It's it's the one that I again. It doesn't remind me like the for, we're not for the fact that his name is on it. This one is like the close up version. It's almost like movie posters or something. I don't know. Like it reminds me of like seventeen hundreds France or something. It's so wildly different. It's got like vignettes around it and everything. It's so unique. Yes, I mean uh, the the details there, the movements there, but yeah, it's it's it's. <laughs> We have a lot more close-ups of people than we ever have, right? And yeah, it's it's a return to what was more like the uh, crucifixion of um, the saint. Uh, God, I forgot her name. I, I'm so bad at trying to remember this across the different things. No, it's um, a, that lady we just saw in all the red that we were talking count. about. Oh, Julia, Saint Julia. Yeah, sorry, I have too many damn tabs open. I need to yeah. close some of this stuff here. But yeah, that the crucifixion <laughs> of Saint Julia. Um, it, it, it's more like that again, where you've got like the, again, the wrinkles in the robes, you can see the detail of the face properly. You have the conversations happening amongst themselves. Yeah. His technique hit an apex here. I feel like he's still uh, doing everything that made him famous in the, in the beginning, but it's a clear evolution to his craft. I mean, this is, yeah, this is more detail in both volume and uh, sheer complexity of things like, the wrinkles of clothing, the wrinkles on a face, the 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 use of uh, extremities and and but also making everything work together, uh, especially with so many people. There's so many figures and it's uh, man, it's, the, the more I dissect his pieces, as much as I wanted to say the Garden of Earthly Desi- Delights was a magnum opus. I really want to say The Last Judgment and this this last famous piece is really speaking to me in terms of uh, what could possibly be the best. I do want to give this one a lot of credit for him clearly continuing to work at his art. Yes. That this is an obvious change from some of his previous style right um and again and, and obviously like not in any bad way like changes you know it may be scary but it's good so I, I mean again he's got some of his trademark smaller details but the way that he has them uh and crafted into the vignettes uh that he's still working with his contemporary sort of imagery outside of jesus how jesus is wearing the thorns and his classic sort of like clean white robe saintly like you know heavenly robe but the other people very much remind you of the people from the martyrdom of St. Julia. There's still very much everything else is him perfecting his more realistic, you know, again, like people just kept saying like, dude, this is too trippy. Like you're freaking me out. And him going like, no, I could paint a lovely hat. Yeah. He's like, no, I could do fantastic hats and, and great details. Like, you know, I've just, I've just been having fun. Like, you know, this like almost feels like a fun. Well, yeah, exactly. Thank you. I was going to say, this is maybe like a patron said, 
like, hey, Geronimus, uh, I love your stuff, but I'm thinking more like this. And here's a sack of gold. And he was just like, absolutely. Yeah, right. Like I could do the hell out of that. Yeah. And, but no ergot. Keep the ergots out of it, please. I'm finally, I'm, I've, I've beat the addiction. I had an intervention. No more ergots. Well, like in every, you know, every historical piece, trippy. that's all they eat. Like, except for like the king's banquet. And then it's like this huge feast. And y- yeah, it's like, it's, I, I've always, I actually have had fantasies about uh, medieval banquet feasts. I was like, man, I would love a spread like that. For just for like no reason, you know, uh, but uh, but to pull it back, uh, what an incredible history and career and uh, just a talent. Uh, let's bring it on home, Mr. Church. Why do the good people need to get into Horonis Bosch? He's one of those people who you don't realize how influential that they were until you literally put it all chronologically you until you stop and look at them and understand when they actually lived and how prolific they were to and then the next time you look at some of your other famous more modern popular artists again like your dalis yeah or other people that you're like holy shit there's no way that dali wasn't aware of this guy's art and didn't appreciate some bosh or that like you know wow this um yeah it, it, it's just it, yeah he clearly inspired uh, hundreds, if not obviously thousands, uh, however many people since then. And luckily enough of them were also artists to where, um, you know, he made it OK to embrace the nightmare fuel that he was the person who. <laughs> yeah. Putting know, the going mirror to those up dark again. Places. To yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and and just doing the hell out of it in a very <laughs> no pun intended way. Yeah. Well, ahead of, the its hell time. of it. Mm, yep. Um, excellently put, Mr. Church. Couldn't have said it better myself. And there you have it, folks. Hieronymus Bosch from top to bottom. Thank you guys for listening. But before we go, you know we got a little extra for you. A little icing on the cake. A little cherry on top for that Sunday with what we call the Gym of the Week. If you don't know what the Gym of the Week is, it's essentially something we like to talk about here at the end of our shows that doesn't quite fit into the scheme of the episode because it did it may just be on our radar in the last day or so, maybe week, maybe month, but we got to give it to you guys so you guys can dig deeper. I have two. Uh, one is um, me and my wife are big Ozark fans, and they just released the part one of the final season on Netflix. If you haven't got into Ozark, it is uh, everything great about shows that are in the vein of Breaking Bad, you know, uh, that anti-hero kind of storyline and plot, and it puts a really big spin on it. And um, I I actually, fun fact, uh, Novo really was hesitant. I was like, Jason Bateman, come on. And then I, I watched- I love Jason Bateman. Yeah, and then I watched, well, I'm so used to his comedic chops. I like him as a comedian. I was like, a, a drama, a serious role for this guy? I don't know. And then I gave it a shot, and now I'm in fucking love with it. And I think that'll happen to you guys too. Uh, number two is an album that a uh, certain someone, I don't know when, maybe before this is released, maybe after, may do a quick cut episode on this. I am in absolutely love with a new jazz album, and that is by Nubia Garcia's. Uh, it's by, excuse me, Nubia Garcia, and the album is called Source. Um, you know, I am going to uh, give my gem to the week to an album that never uh ceases to just amaze me with uh how an oldie but a goodie yeah it's kind of oldie but a goodie um it, and it's diverse and granted it's it's definitely heavy but uh i am a massive queens of the stone age fan oh get and... the hell out of town i was just listening to the queens of the stone age well i hope it, it was the album I, can songs I guess? for the death it was that one it was that one that is the one with a lot of their hits and granted yeah i i don't want to like say that it's their best album necessarily but it has a lot of the hits that you would know, and it's a great jumping off point because I love all of their shit. And it's actually, um, it's literally like the last of a sort of era, their earlier era, yeah. when their, the, some of their lineup changed and their songwriting changed. And uh, yeah, it, it's the best. It's one of the best albums outside of like later. I appreciate that they span a lot of time. Uh, so this this Songs for the Deaf came out in, I believe, like the late 90s. And it's one of their best until... I believe it was like 2013's um, uh, like clockwork. Mm. But yeah, if you ever heard like go with the flow, 
Uh, again, like no one, no one knows. Um, uh, you know, one or two of their other hits were on there, but the, some of their best songs from Songs for the Deaf. It's an amazing album, and I, it's a concept album. I love that it has the weird radio thing between it. Yes. So that from top to bottom, the you get those skits. little like yeah. skits. Yeah. So that's another thing is I love a concept album. Oh, I love too. that dumb shit. I don't know why, but I fall for it. I eat it up. So and especially when it's one of my favorite bands, mm, Songs for the Deaf. Yeah, that's crazy. This is, you know, it's weird that uh, when two people are on the same wavelength, I literally, and I'm not just saying this for the show, I literally put that, I was craving that album just out of the blue. Like I woke, you know that feeling like when you wake up, you're like, I feel like listening to this today. It was that exact album. That's that's crazy to me. Because it's fucking great. It is It is great. I um, When I was a kiddo, I saw them live during this tour. And, no shit. Yeah. Yeah, it was awesome. Uh, yeah, it was really great. They played um they played everything but track three on the album. And there was I'll never forget the whole the whole place chanting, you know, like song three, song like they really wanted to hear it. Um and it just they never they made they never played it, you know. That was wild. Spoilers. Um before we get off, I do want to say this. Um, this is probably not not a first, but probably a first for me to talk about it. Um, I I took you up on your uh on your gym. Me and my wife me and my wife watched the night house last night. And yeah. we were we were fascinated with where it went. Um, right. it was I thought it was gonna be I mean, it, it is supernatural. I should I should start there. I just I don't know. I thought it was going to be I go more into the direction of the doppelganger stuff then. But I did like the concept of uh, death. You know, we me and my wife talked about it. it's like essentially like death touched her at one point in her life. And then it was coming after her, you know, later in life. Um, that's kind of how we interpreted the the. Yeah. Entity, yeah. Without will. getting too spoiler or giving too much away, I would definitely say that like even you can read the synopsis. It's literally about a grieving widow. So again, it's about her having to deal with death, uh, to put it lightly and to put it simply. So, um, yeah, I'm glad you guys watched it. Uh, and I mean, yeah, overall, I love the way that like, again, like the cinematography and, and the, the angles and some of the effects were used to make the quote unquote, like villain, the silhouette. Will, yeah. Of his stuff like that was amazing. Entity, I've right. never seen anything like that. So yeah, I, I loved, I loved it. It was fantastic. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. And really uh, unique. Good um, out to me. And so, yeah, that, where I we'll, we'll do, yeah, we'll do another piggyback Jim. So again, the night house and again, Peter Grick, uh, G R I C. Um, for a contemporary artist that dives into scale and and volume and height like never before seen. And if you like that, of course, you can check out our stuff at Novo Day, at, excuse me, at underscore Novo underscore Day, and Day is D-E, and at Novo Day Media. You can, of course, check out our products at NovoDayProductions.com. There you'll find things like the Entropy Sessions, Adulteration, Post Meridium, Cancel Culture Lotto, and a lot more to come. And uh, if you would like to hire Philip Church, the one and only- Hang out. Talk voices. <laughs> Tell them how they can get a hold of you, Mr. Church. Yes, you can go to my main website where you I have a, a, my actual some clips and, and samples and whatnot. It's philipchurch.tech. Philip is with one L. Uh, but I'm also on Facebook where you can link there. So if you're, you're more of like a social media kind of person, just go to facebook.com and look for Philip Church, ProVO Nerd. Um, should be hopefully pretty easy to find. And you might even hear me talking about things like this podcast and the Entropy Sessions. Um, yeah. <laughs> so... Um, those are those are the ways and expect some fun, shiny website updates when trying to really make sure to make this the year of like staying in better touch. And I've got some great uh, stuff in the works. I'm excited to share in the future, too. So and we'll yeah, um, we'll keep everyone up to date. Right. And uh, so don't forget to like and subscribe, follow and hit that notification bell. And if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, we would appreciate a comment, a rate and or a review. We appreciate it. And until next time, guys. Be good to each other. And as always, good luck and Godspeed. We love you. Art of the Beholder is brought to you by Novo Day Productions. Created and hosted by Novo Day and the Novo Day Collective. Facebook.com slash Novo Day Media. At Novo Day Media on Twitter and Instagram. Music by A Company. Facebook.com slash Aco Music 123. Aco on Spotify. Logo designed by Tom Justice, J-E-S-T-U-S, of thejusticecompany.com and executively produced by Clayton Anderson. All rights reserved.